Thank you, Anka. So give me a second. Can you see my screen? So uh, as Anka mentioned before, I'm going to talk on the efficiency and flexibility of linear map vector commitments. This is a result of joint work with Matteo Campanelli and Anka from Protocol Labs and Carla Raffles from University of Fab. So the motivation of our work is to study to develop vector commitment schemes in the setting of proof of space. To start with, we, we need to find our definition, uh, which framework are we going to work on? And for that, and for the reasons that I explained before, we would like a definition that englobes individual openings, subset openings, but we also want to be able to perform some computation on the committed data. So we want to be able to perform, or we want functional vector commitments. We want to be able to perform computations on the vectors that are uh, inside the commitments. For this, we choose the framework Laya Malavolta of linear uh, map commitments uh, presented in the work in Crypto 2019. And also because of the reasons that uh, Anga and Dario has explained before, we want to add updatability and aggregation to our linear map commitments. So what's our um, uh, well, a bit of a, of a map. I'm going to start with the definitions. I will explain to you our constructions and then some efficiency results uh, we got for the special case of proof of space. So what is a linear map commitment, linear map vector commitment in our case? Uh, it's a scheme where we can apply linear maps to our vector. And these linear maps will take as input our vector in uh, of size m and will give us a vector of size n. Of course, because we are not working just with vectors, we are working with commitments, we live in the sanction world, we want to start from a commitment to our vector b and get a commitment to uh, the function map, the linear map in, in our commitment b, in our vector b. So uh, if you, I mean, it's easy to see that if when n equals one, these linear functions can be represented by vectors. So in this vector f, we have every one of the coefficients of f, the function f as elements. And for the uh, performing an evaluation of f in b, is is basically performing an inner plot between uh, the vector that represents function f and our vector b. For the case of for the case of an arbitrary n, what we are doing is something similar, but instead of doing an inner plot, we are doing a matrix vector plot. We have matrix which, uh, whose rows are the independent functions uh, corresponding to each element of the, of the output. The case n equals one is the one that will capture individual openings. So we can set f to be the function that when represented as a vector is the canonical vector j. And doing the inner product or evaluating this function in B will give us the position J. For the case of subset openings, we will need to move to the case of a, of a bigger N, a, an N that is the size of the subset. And basically what we will do is opening independently each of the positions in our subset and we'll get the subset opening as a vector. So uh, we already have our definition the, of linear map vector commitments that, as I say, englobes individual openings, subset openings, and also like evaluating functions in our vector. Now, I will go a bit fast in updatability because it has already been explained by, by Dario, but the idea is that the provers will have to store something in the proof of space, a commitment to the vector B, the digest, but also they may have recomputed some proofs. In the case of proof of space, they will be, this will be like individual proof, but we want to be a bit more general. So PF1 here is a proof of the opening of B in evaluated in function F1. When we update our vector and it changed, let's say in one position by some factor delta, we want to be able to take the previous commitment to B and become, um, obtain a commitment to B prime to our new vector without having to compute it from scratch. And we will want the same for, for these pre-computed uh, openings. We want to update them. We don't want to compute them from scratch. 
For aggregation of proofs, um, we will consider a bigger spectrum. Bear in mind that aggregating proofs of vector commitments in the setting that we are working on is aggregating polynomial equations because we are working with, with vectors encoded as polynomials. This aggregation can, uh, can be same commitment or cross commitment, uh, where same commitment aggregation allow us to aggregate openings of different functions evaluated in the same vector. So the goal will be to have only one proof that can prove both openings. In the case of cross commitment uh, aggregation, we want to aggregate proofs that correspond to different vectors and may or may not correspond to the same function. Again, the goal would be to have only just one proof that convinces the verifier of all these statements. Independently from this, we have that aggregation can be one hop or unbounded. In one hop aggregation, we can only aggregate fresh proofs and then we have to stop. So once we aggregate two proofs, that's, every, that's all we can do. And in unbounded aggregation, we can aggregate fresh proofs, but we can also aggregate already aggregated proofs. Why do we call this unbounded and not incremental? Because in incremental aggregation, the order doesn't matter. And for us, for our result, the order of the aggregations do matter, and we will see that um, later. On the other hand, we uh, distinguish between two kinds of aggregations when talking about subvector openings or individual position openings. So this is not applicable to functions, but we can have an aggregation that is either native or non-native. What do we mean? In a native aggregation of openings to subsets, the aggregation looks exactly as a fresh opening for the union of the subset. In a non-native aggregation, the aggregated proof still proves uh, like the opening of the union, but the proof usually involves some randomness. It doesn't look like a fresh proof. So it's different. So this is what, what we want to achieve. We want our linear map vector commitments to be updatable and to be uh, aggregatable. What we can do, uh, our result, uh, is for same commitment and cross commitment unbounded aggregation, but uh, not non-native. This half native is because you can apply other techniques to our result, but our result is a non-native unbounded aggregation for both cases, same commitment and cross commitment. So we want all of this, and our starting point is pairing-based constructions. We want to work in the in this setting because you know we like constant stuff and constant work people. And in particular, when we start analyzing and, and working on this, we we found these two very well, we didn't find them, they are quite popular, but there are these very nice work. One is called aggregatable selector commitments for stateless cryptocurrencies. From now on, on Thomas Quetol. And then we have point proofs, aggregating proofs for multiple vector commitments from now on, on point proofs. And they do consider, they are both pairing-based constructions. They do consider uh, a similar set in two hours. So they do consider the same properties. But you, you have trade-offs. Uh, the Thomas Quetol construction does consider a vector commitments. It has one hop and native aggregation and also defines uh, protocols for updatability. In the case of point proofs, they do also consider a vector commitments. They describe a one hop aggregation that is for same commitment and also cross commitment, but neither of this work consider uh, applying linear functions to the committed vectors or the unbounded aggregation. So we start from here and our intuition was like, this works could do more. Like, we can like extract some more um, capabilities from them. And what we first notice is, okay, what, what do they have in common? They have in common that they are both homomorphic in their commitments and proofs. What, is, what does it mean that uh, when, when we say that vector commitment scheme is homomorphic in the commitment, it means that whenever you are committing to a linear combination of uh, two vectors or more vectors, what you get is the same linear combination, but of the commitment to the vector. On the other hand, homomorphic proofs is something quite similar, 
whenever you open a vector to a linear combination of, of some linear maps, you get the linear combination of the individual openings of the vector with, with each of the maps. And the same when linear combination of vectors to uh, the same linear map. So our first result, or the first one that I'm going to, to talk about here, is that whenever you have a linear map vector commitment that has homomorphic proofs and commitments, then it's updatable and unbounded aggregate. So with our framework, uh, point proofs can be unbounded aggregatable. Thomas Quetol can be unbounded aggregatable when giving up the native aggregation. And also point proofs is updatable. I will explain a bit more about this now. So let's start with our constructions. We like when building these linear map vector commitments, we want to start from the simplest linear map, which is the one for the case n equal one and in a product term. So if you are going to miss some slide, this can be your best candidate. I'm going to explain the inner product arguments. I do think they are like quite simple, but if like it's not necessary for the rest of the talk that you pay attention to the details here. We have one construction that uses commitment key Lagrange polynomials, and another one that uses as commitment keys monomial basis, the monomial basis of the polynomials. And for the Lagrange basis, we will start with a set of roots of unity. This is important, it cannot be any set. And we commit to our vector using these lambda i's, which are the Lagrange interpolation polynomials, and to the function using the same. We call that when we evaluate lambda i in some of the roots of unity, if that root of unity is the omega to the, y, to the i, it will be one, otherwise it will be zero. So we multiply these two vectors and what we have are all the cross terms. So we separate the ones where B and F share index from those where they don't. In those where they don't, we have a multiplication of Lagrange polynomials that do not share index. Those, and this multiplication is divisible by the vanishing polynomial of the set. And in the other one, we, hit, we have this lambda i to the square, and we get, can get rid of that power also by dividing by the vanishing polynomial. So we get something like this. This, uh, this is the vanishing polynomial, the product of all the terms x minus the, the elements of the set. And look that what we have that is not like, I don't know if you see my mouse, but this that we have here, this polynomial is almost the inner product. We just not need to get, uh, to get rid of these Lagrangians. And because we are working in a set of roots of unity, this is very simple. The Lagrange polynomials evaluated in zero will be a constant that is the inverse of the size of the, of the set. So we have to divide uh, by x to, to show the evaluation in zero. And now with some aesthetics, we get an argument for proving a claim value for the inner product between b and f starting from commitments to them. Then, the, I mean, this is this inner product comes from a previous work with Carla, but the one in the monomial basis is a contribution of this work. We start with um, a commitment to, to vector B uh, with a monomial basis, the, the natural one, and we do commit to function F in reverse order. Again, we multiply these polynomials and we get all the cross terms. We separate those where B and F share index from those where they don't. Um, in here, we have it a bit more easy because the inner product is multiplied by x to n minus one. This doesn't depend on the on i. So basically, we already have the inner product. And now we just need to, to make sure that there is nothing else in the coefficient corresponding to the power n minus one. So we separate the rest into parts. Everything that has degree uh, m or bigger and everything that has degree smaller than n minus one. Again, some aesthetics, and we have our own arguments. Importantly, um, Thomas Quitol is 
uh, is a protocol in the in the Lagrange basis. It's similar to our to our inner probe. Uh, the only thing is that we add this functional functional ability, functional property. And for the monorail basis, again, it's quite similar to, to point proofs when you consider f as a function that element. But um, then the best thing about our, our construction is that we do not make assumptions on the SRS. For point proofs, you need uh, to be missing one power in the SRS. That, that could be a bit tricky when you want to like recycle existing SRS. So we get rid of that assumption. And again, we add uh, functionality. So starting for inner probe arguments, we are still with these linear maps that arrive to only one element and not two vectors. How can we update? So having an inner probe that has homomorphic proof and commitment and our committed vector that has changed, we can update the commitment basically by taking the previous commitment and adding lambda times a commitment to the canonical vector corresponding to the position that we are updating. Because uh, our commitment scheme is homomorphic, this, this works. And for updating the proofs, we need some help. We need ab uh, updatable keys. These updatable keys are going to be all the openings of all the canonical vectors in all the functions represented by other canonical vectors. The intuition is that because this is homomorphic from these ES canonical vectors, we can reconstruct any function. At first sight, this may look quadratic to you, but for the case of the Lagrange basis, Thomas et al. Uh, have a result where you can compute all these proofs from an SRS or an updatable key of size 2M. So that's covered. And for the monomial basis, these proofs are actually powers of X that are already in the SRS. So our monomial construction has as an advantage that updatability is basically keyless. We don't need any, any help, only, only the SRS. Okay, so once we have all these openings, and again, this is general for any inner probe that has homomorphic proofs. We can go from our old proof that F evaluated in B equals some element. And we add a linear combination of all the openings in the updated position against um, the canonical vectors that we need to reconstruct F. So it, it, this depends on the on how we represent f as a vector. Again, we should uh, this works. <laughs> so this works uh, because we are working uh, with homomorphic proofs. So this is for repeatability, and for body aggregation. I think the intuition is quite simpler. We have two proofs that we want to uh, to to aggregate. We have homomorphic proof, so we just aggregate them as a verifier to give us some challenge. Our new proof is a linear combination of the old proofs with, with the challenge of the verifier, and then it has the size of just one proof. Importantly, to check this, the verifier will need to have access to this randomness. Fair enough, uh, she has chosen it. But in the case of aggregating already aggregated proofs, we, we can do the same, we can ask the verifier for, uh, for some randomness. But the problem is that now, in order to verify, the verifier will need to have access to the fresh randomness that she has just chosen, but also we need to have access to the previous randomness. So this is where, where order comes uh, to, to on the table. And to keep all this information, we make a tree of aggregation challenges. This leads in the field is not a big overhead for the proofs. A trade-off, you can get uh, unbounded aggregation, but you need to add this extra tree of elements in the field to your proof. Now, we have inner products that are updatable and that are unbounded aggregated. 
aggregatable. What happens when we aggregate many inner proofs? We have all these all these proofs that these elements y equal the inner product of the functions f i, uh, well, the vectors representing the functions f i with the vector. Once we aggregate them in our interactive non-native way, what we get is actually a proof that all these vectors together uh, against b equals some new vector. So what we get is a proof a vector commitment that takes vectors in M and gives vectors in N. What I'm saying here is that whenever you have an inner product argument that has some homomorphic proofs and commitments, you can build, I mean, you already have linear map vector commitments for linear maps that take vectors of M and gives vectors of N for any arbitrary N. And importantly, if we have unbounded aggregation, about applicability is tricky because we have missed the homomorphic, the homomorphic property of our proofs when we start aggregating. It is possible to uh, update with like already aggregated proofs, but in the setting we are working it doesn't make much sense. Updating is for pre-computed stuff and uh, aggregation is for responding to special logging. So we didn't explore that that, that path, but uh, like my intuition or our intuition is that you can do it, it may not pay off. Okay, so we have we have our framework for constructing linear vector commitments from inner product arguments. And now I'm going to talk about an efficient result, many like simple but non-trivial observations to tackle the verifier in proof of space settings. So as it was mentioned before, in the proof of space setting, the verifier may challenge the prover with openings in order to check that it's uh, storing what the prover is claiming that it's storing. These subsets are not um, are not something that we care of their shape. So, in in the Lagrange spaces, we have a native. A subset opening that is due to Thomas Quetol. And again, don't worry if you get lost here. We have the commitment to the vector, to the sub vector. And basically, what we do is comparing them in the positions that they are supposed to share. For the monomial basis, a subset opening is just uh, a linear random combination of individual openings. And the important thing is that in both these uh, proofs, we have. The commitment to B, the encoding to B, and the proofs, which are H or R and H, depending on the setting. Then we have something that represents the openings, either the commitment to the vector or the linear combination of the openings, which are BI in both equations. But we have the important part are these two polynomials. These two polynomials are the ones that describe the set. These the computation of these polynomials is something that the verifier cannot delegate unless it has some trusted party because it's checking the challenge itself. But again, in proof of space, we do not really care about what these subsets are as soon as they are challenges for the verifier. Computing these polynomials naively will take size of I uh, operations in the group for the verifier. And a natural question is like, can we do better? Like, since we don't care about the subset I being something specific, can we find special subsets that are easy to open for the verifier where these polynomials are easy to compute? The answer is equivalence classes. I mean, in subset I, we include only positions whose index are congruent, uh, uh, like to each other, in some modulus, for example, I can choose all the positions that are congruent to zero, modulus four, that are congruent to three, modulus seven, or all the positions that are congruent to one, modulus zero. So these are equivalent classes. And the vanishing polynomial of these, uh, of these equivalent classes in the Lagrange setting 
is very easy to compute if the if the size of the of the subset is k. Uh, this is a vanishing polynomial, which can be computed in constant time by the prover. Equivalence classes, when we are working with roots of unities, are cosets. Uh, in case you are familiar with with this, vanishing polynomials for cosets are very very efficient to compute. I have this very simple way shape, sorry. And then for the case of the monomial basis, if we cheat a bit with the randomness, not too much, just reordering the powers of the randomness, we can get a geometrical series. Again, this series can be computed in constant time by the verifier. Importantly, you may have not by powers of x. So actually what we have to do is like multiply all the, the the equation, the polynomial equation that the verifier has to check uh, times one minus gamma x to the k. But the taking, taking away detail here is that there are some subsets whose opening can be checked in constant time in the group by the verifier. So this is one thing. We have very efficient subset opening. Now, and this is something that extends to polynomial equations in general, we can have a very efficient verifier when aggregating proofs if we are willing to give up SRS. Actually not giving up SRS, but growing our SRS. So let's say we have three polynomials, B1, B2, B3. They all live in, in FM. And naturally, if we can have now vectors of size 3M instead of M, we can just aggregate them one next to the other. Believe it or not, we can also do it this way, intercalating. Uh, for those familiar with Flunk, this is the way uh, they aggregate. But um, for obvious reasons, I will stick to this to this case. So the, the encoding of this new vector, it will be a, a polynomial that now has size 3M. For the first M positions, we'll encode vector VI. The positions from m to 2m minus 1 will encode p2. And the positions for x 2m to x 3m minus 1 will encode p3. This leaves in, again, it's a vector of three, size 3m. So we will need an SRS of size 3m to commit to this. But then we can ask the verifier for a challenge and a challenge alpha, and then replace the power xm. Uh, with that. This will be like a partial opening of this polynomial, which will take constant time for the verifier to check. And what we will have is an aggregation as our normal interactive aggregation of the polynomials according B1, B2, and B3 in FM. So what do we have? We have an SRS that, will be need, uh, that we need uh, a bigger SRS I mean, we need a bigger SRS, but after some constant work by the verifier, we can go back uh, to FM to work with uh, polynomials of degree M. So these are two things of independent interest, like opening uh, subsets in an efficient way with constant verifier, aggregating polynomials, but we can merge them together and get multi-openings with constant verifier. So again, this is a um, case of interest in the proof of state setting. We may have many vectors. Why cannot we just open, like challenge all of them together, all the, all the digests together? How would this work? Well, I have an aggregation of, of vectors. I have a bigger vector that includes my individual ones. And let's say I open uh, the special subset of elements that are congruent to five uh, modulus M. What I'm opening is the fifth position of every one of those vectors with a constant verifier. We can do this also with subsets. So instead of opening something uh, like congruence is modulus M, I do a small modulus, smaller modulus, and I get subset openings of many vectors with a constant verifier. I think that's almost it. Some taking away details. We to give guarantees 
uh, for updatability and embodied aggregation, starting with homomorphic proofs and commitments. We give a framework for constructing linear map vector commitments from linear product arguments. We uh, provide two linear map vector commitment constructions, starting from inner probes. And then we have a constant verifier uh, for subset challenges, aggregation proofs, and then multi openings. Thank you very much. I uh, hope to see you soon on AirPrint. Hey, thank you, Arancha, for the great talk. Yeah, that was a nice balance between the practical, like the theoretical contribution and some practical aspects. So questions, comments? Okay, we have a question from Dario. Uh, what is the running time of the unbounded aggregation when you want to apply it to say N proofs in a tree fashion? N proofs in a what, sorry? In a tree fashion, the tree fashion you explained. Okay, no, I mean, the, the running time of the aggregation for, for the verifier is linear in the amount of proofs that you're aggregating, sorry, for the prover is a linear uh, amount of exponentiation in the group, uh, linear in the, in the amount of proofs that you're aggregating um, from the verifier as well. Like what you really save is a proof size. It's, it's not different from just like normal uh, interactive aggregation. Does this answer the question, Dario? Yes, 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 it answers the question. I have another question. <laughs> okay, you can you can ask it. So do so everybody hears me? Yes, yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't. So the other question is, um, what's the difference between the inner product argument for monomial basis that you give and the one from the um, uh, Liebert at all uh, functional commitment, the Liebert, Liebert Raman uh, Jung uh, functional commitment for inner product. Mm, I don't know if I remember now the Liebert at all construction. Um, I think I can try to answer that one because I was looking recently to compare with Liebert uh, construction. So uh, that one is using another assumption and um, a subgroup decisional problem. Uh, in a composite order groups. Uh, and I guess that's less standard than pairing based assumption we have. And because of that, um, as I remember, the concrete parameters were, uh, were larger in their case for the inner product. Um, and also, uh, that's not sure, I didn't check. It's not a claim as a contribution in their uh, in their paper, like the homomorphic proofs of homomorphic uh, commitments, neither updatability of aggregation. So we are not sure that this property is also applied to their scheme. Well, I mean th that scheme can also be ported in prime order groups, and it's actually the the scheme by Lyme Malavolta. If you drop the, the multiple in a product part is actually that scheme in, in prime order groups. Ah, okay. Then if we compare with Lion Malavolta, we have that uh, better public parameters. I think that's the way we, where we perform better. Um, so they have a sub vector opening in their paper, which uh, requires N square public parameter where N is the size of the vector. Um, while also their um, linear map uh, construction requires uh, n times m, where those are the dimensions for uh, for the two uh, two sets. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And if nobody asks questions, I haven't. <laughs> no, it was a nice talk. So one thing that I did, I missed uh, when you start talking about the equivalence classes, if I understand well, you want to use these as a um, sort of optimize the random positions that you get uh, in the proof of space that you have to open, or yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, if you're going to 
ask the prover to open the vector in some subset just to challenge him. Do it with subsets that you can check like fast. Because but then you challenge... uh, my question is okay, then I got it correctly, but then my question is why this is random enough for security? Well, the, the question would be actually if it is more like better than individual positions. Right? I mean, it's as good as individual positions, and that's, that's easy to see. But our question, actually, and this is something that we haven't like decided yet, is whether this is better than having just challenging individual positions. But I think that's even broader, right? Like, how, how is the trade off between subsets and individual positions? It's actually better to, to challenge with subsets. And I mean, asymptotically, maybe it's the same. Maybe we have like bigger spectrum of random things, but I, it's not clear for us yet whether it makes a difference or not. <laughs>